Well, hello and welcome to another episode of National Review's Capital Record. This is a uh, not only very special episode that we're about to get into, but it's a special little project we're going to do here for the month of April. I've been talking about it throughout March. Last week we had uh, Dr. Art Laffer, and I announced that the month of April I'm doing something I want to call Mentor Month. There are four individuals that I credit as being significant mentors in my life and career, each in a very different aspect and a different lane. And I wanted to go through and talk to each one of them uh, about the impact that they've had in my life and career and their own contributions to the very subjects that are at the heart of this podcast here at the Capitol Record. Uh, the end of April, we're going to close up with uh, myself, with my late father, Dr. Greg Bonson, uh, where, of course, he has not been with us now for 28 years, but we were able to put together a, a really, um, I think, wonderful project around some of his old contributions to the subject of work and productivity uh, for a, a philosopher and theologian, let alone for a Presbyterian. He was, he was pretty astute in some of these elements. Um, and so Greg Bonson represents, of course, my first mentor because I met him first and on so many different levels. He had the biggest impact anybody could have ever had on me as my father, my best friend, my mentor, um, and so forth. But when you become an adult, let alone losing your father right as you are entering adult life, you form other mentors and connections as well. And I'm very blessed that this uh, month there are three individuals besides my father are going to join us in this podcast. And the first of those is here with me today. And he's a gentleman by the name of Nick Murray. He's sitting here with me in my New York office. And uh, Nick is someone who I have uh, known, uh, who I have been reading every month of my life since the very first month that I begin life as a financial advisor. And so before I start chatting with Nick, I wanted to give a little background as to, to why Nick's here and the impact he's had in, in my life. Um, I haven't often gone to Nick for marriage advice or parenting advice. I guess indirectly, there's things that do come up there too, by the way. But um, when I refer to his mentorship, we're referring to a very specific aspect of my chosen vocational field in the world of financial advisory. And what happened for me is having sold the old music management business that I was a part of after my dad died until the point at which Jolene and I got engaged and we had been going through the 1990s equity boom and living through uh, the insanity of Super Bowl commercials for Pets.com, um, I decided to enter the training program at a firm uh, formerly known as Payne Weber uh, that was quickly absorbed by UBS, a uh, huge Swiss bank behemoth. And I began the first six years of my career there. And at the exact same time, got introduced by a friend of mine, I hope you're listening right now, Kevin Reed, who is uh, currently a manager with Merrill Lynch Bank of America, but had been a, a broker in the Merrill Lynch system back in the 90s. He had said, yeah, check out this guy, Nick Murray. So luckily for me, as I'm recording here, my wife has walked outside the room. She's been with us here this morning. But um, Nick had a book that had come out. He had previously written a book called Excellent Investment Advisor, and then uh, a newer kind of updated version called The New Financial Advisor came out. Jolene and I were married on September 8th, 2001, mm -hmm. and we were in the air flying to Tahiti for our honeymoon when 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. And we spent uh, the first 10 days of our marriage locked down in Tahiti, but we were supposed to be there. So it wasn't really a lockdown for us. The, uh, the world travel kind of reopened just in time for us to come back. So we had a normal honeymoon as much as you could when your country was under attack. And we, uh, I had not yet even taken my Series 7 license. I was in the training program at Payne Weber. I had started in it before the wedding, but um, was getting ready to kind of begin this new career. And I, we'd go down to the beach in Morea or Bora Bora, and I'd bring one of Nick's books, and I'd underline the hell out of it, and highlight it, and I still have both. I probably have as many words written in the margins of Nick's books as he wrote in the books. I devoured it. 
I devoured it without any context at all to what I was devouring because I didn't know how right he was about things because I hadn't started the business of being an advisor. I hadn't actually started trying to acquire clients. I hadn't started trying to serve clients, let alone actually allocate capital or perform financial planning services on behalf of clients. Um, at some point oh, thereafter, Nick may remember exactly when the, the newsletter that he did monthly, uh, I, th I think it still stayed as a, a, a mailed piece for a while before it went to a, a PDF. It sure, it sure did. And, and I would get that every every month and, you know, the, the whatever the subscription price I thought then and I still think now it was the biggest ripoff I've ever seen. But I mean that the opposite. I mean, I was ripping him off because let's say I was paying something in the range of 20 bucks a month for something that I would have paid 20 bucks a day for. Um, I read it every month and I had a lot of success as an advisor right out the gate. Uh, but what I don't, I don't think Nick's biggest value add to my life and career was in the way I built the business. It was what to do when you have a business. And what I mean by this is relating to clients and believing that a person who could become a client, that you're entering a relationship of trust. And if they don't trust you, then they shouldn't be your client. And I think that more or less, I have had a very happy career not merely because the economic success and the enterprise value we've built in our firm and the income and all those things that you know, obviously were our big focus. They were a much bigger focus when I was 27 than they are now that I'm, I'm 50 because you know now I'm not desperate anymore and in my 20s I was desperate. But um, the peace of mind that is jeopardized by working with a toxic person and the joy that is realized by only working with people who like you and who you like. I have no ability to price tag that, but that is something I got from the man sitting next to me right now, Nick Murray. That concept has driven pretty much everything I've done for the last 23 years in this business. I do um, imagine there's certain things here and there over the years that Nick and I might be not be exactly totally identical on, but more or less. The, the general overarching principle of um, this being a truth teller's business, of the source of the trust you build with your clients being your own trustworthiness, of um, believing that if someone is not interested in your point of view, does not trust you implicitly, and therefore you will not embark into a professional relationship with them, that it is their loss, not yours, that you are interviewing them, they are not interviewing you. These are not gimmicks or tricks or psychological advantages that one can kind of position. At least they weren't for me. They were a lifestyle, but more importantly, they were a worldview. And so in 2009, Nick began doing an annual symposium here in Manhattan and the 2009 was not a coincidence. In 2008, the whole world blew up. And those of us, including Nick Murray, who are bullish on the U.S. economy, bullish on U.S. stock market returns, bullish on history and bullish on the future, there was an assault on our worldview in the sense of a rather significant, not only decline in housing values and credit and, and uh, equity values, but in, in Wall Street in general, there was this sort of general um, questioning about just the nature of the advice business, the nature of, of capital markets. And Nick began doing an annual symposium. I've attended every single one uh, that, that he's ever done. There are obviously a couple of those little COVID interruption deals where it went virtual. But we used to do it at uh, the Marriott East Side, which ironically was at the time uh, owned by Morgan Stanley, where, where I worked. Um, and it was Kitty Corner from the Waterford story. It was at 48th Street, Lexington Avenue. Some of my fondest memories coming out of financial crisis. At that point, I had moved to Morgan Stanley. I had a successful business. I became managing director in the firm. And I would walk across the street on some you know, beautiful fall morning in October. People do not realize how gorgeous New York City is in October. And he'd start at what, 6.37 in the morning, a little bagels and locks. And then we, he would just talk. And I would take it in 
And it didn't matter how many times I'd heard what was being said. Um, year over year, there are always some kind of new articulations and, and new perspectives. But what was happening that he couldn't have known is that there were new applications because there are things happening in our own practices, in our own businesses, in our own lives. And even if it's the same wisdom, it now year over year gets to be recontextualized to the vantage point of somebody like myself. Um, I was in awe during his Q&A at his um, ability to respond to questions with utter uh, disdain for stupidity if it was warranted and, and oh charm, charming wit uh, where, where it may have been warranted. But anyways, um, we've done that uh, every year now. The, the venue has is, is grown larger and impact larger. But there is very few people, though only those of us in our business know this, um, that have the respect that, that Nick Murray has across the financial advisory profession. There are others that may attempt to do newsletters and, and symposiums and, and writing and speaking and, and whatnot. Um, I don't read any of them, follow any of them, pay any of them. And that's not to say that there, that there aren't others who are good, but they're not Nick Murray. And uh, Nick deserves uh, this spot in me identifying him as a mentor in my life because literally now for 23 years, uh, there's been this constant monthly influence in the way I see things, understand things, and the way that I've built and run my business. Um, getting rid of clients when you needed to. And so that's the last story I'll tell here before we bring Nick on. In uh, February 2006, um, I, I guess I can't say the name of the client, but uh, there was a gentleman who we brought in, very wealthy guy, had sold a business that made windowsill furnishings. And naturally, a business like that well, must have sold for tens of millions of dollars because windowsill furnishings or decor sounds like a very scalable business. But this was a pre-financial crisis, housing related things, you know, were just in a bubble. So he had sold, he was very arrogant, difficult, tricky guy. I had built up a good business, I was making a living. Julie and I started having kids, she was a stay-at-home mom. Things were all right, but I wasn't interested in getting rid of business at the time. Now I don't, I don't ever think about it. Um, but back then, you know, that, that it was a difficult deal. So this guy was a drain on me for about a year. And uh, I read Nick, read Nick, read Nick. And then I uh, woke up one day and I fired this client who was a, a significant part of revenue. I think I replaced him in three days. Maybe it was three weeks, I don't sure. know. But uh, that moment is when I decided I now had a career as a financial advisor. Not before then. I had a paycheck and I had a good practice. I'd gotten recruited from a good firm to a better firm, all that kind of stuff. But when I fired a big client, um, that's when I knew I'd made it. And uh, I hate to say, but that was not the last client I fired. Uh, but it was the first of significance and it was a direct result. I never talked to Nick about it, never reached out and asked him for any advice. I didn't need to because he was giving it to me in the course of his uh, $20 a month advice via newsletter. And... Um, $5.2 billion of assets later, uh, 60 plus employees, seven offices, and more importantly, uh, 25 years of just incredible memories and experiences in what I consider to be the greatest profession in the world, doing the only thing I can imagine doing. I now am sitting down with that gentleman who has had that impact in my life and career. All of that to say, Nick Murray, welcome to Capital Record. Well, thank you very much, David. I'm happy to be here with you. I'm happy for your success. I'm happy to have had some early part in it. And just before we started, I confess that I didn't, I couldn't articulate what it was that you thought I had done for you. Um, n now I have a sense of it. And then, of course you're right that it's, that it's trust. But I think the larger issue for me has always been um, that if you were going to give advice and be paid for advice, you had to insist that the advice be followed, that it wasn't a suggestion, that you weren't a reading a menu, uh, that, that, it, that we deserved, fully deserved to be on the level of 
the finest physicians or the finest attorneys who you turn to for advice. And when they give you the advice, they take it. And our business was, oddly enough, was never like that. Maybe we deserved it. We probably did to some extent decades ago, but uh, it, it, it's, that's what it comes down to. It's as simple as that for me. We, God knows we give the best advice that we're capable of from the deepest parts of our selves. And in addition to that, we give advice that has always worked in the long term, always. Um, and to have that advice quibbled with or quarreled with or, uh, you know, rejected in any way, I, I just, I never understood why anyone of us would take that. If he believed in his advice, and if in fact he was or she was giving advice that, that had never failed to work in the long term, um, I just didn't think, A, I didn't see why we had to sell it to anybody. Mm. And I certainly didn't see why we had to keep selling it to people who should have bought it by now. And I guess that's, that's my raise on debt. I think that in a sense, that, that line of thinking, that philosophy that you, you taught me, it, it was so convicting to me because there were two reasons. One was moral and related to the client, yeah. and one was practical or pragmatic and related to me and my family. That it, what you're saying is why you can't really in good conscience take a fee from somebody that is not following your advice. Yeah, you're, you're, you're getting paid to not deliver value. Mm -hmm. And, and that really resonated with me. But then I also believe that the sort of internal corrosive effect of working with people that are disrespecting yeah. you, yeah. that over time it tears down your own self-worth. Totally. And you always know that there's somebody else out there who would welcome your advice. You may not know who yeah. it is at the moment, but you don't have the energy or the time to open yourself up to that person if your life force is being sucked out by somebody who says, you know, we got to get out of the market because the dollar is losing its uh, uh, reserve status or whatever the apocalypse du jour is, it's, it's at some point you wake up and say, not only do I need this person, but there's someone else who really needs me and would respect and welcome my advice and i'll never be able to find that person if i keep feeding the ego of this person but the but the motive is always whether people are, there's varying degrees of self-consciousness the motive is always that someone can say i really want to help the person they want the revenue they want the client yeah there's a short-sightedness to it do you think that there is were you ever tempted to hear the advice that when when you're in this stage of your career you can have a little higher tolerance for bad behavior and then at a later stage you tighten it up or did you always feel that from the very beginning there was one way to do this no i certainly didn't feel it from the from the very beginning my growth as an advisor was very slow and very painful mm. um, um but as one acquires the sense the you said the moral sense and it is very much a moral sense not just the economic or the financial sense but the moral sense that one is guiding people the way they really should be guided um i think it it just got easier and easier to say you know what this isn't a fit and um but let's let's you go find an advisor who is more congenial to you, whatever that means. Yeah. Well, and that's a, that's the interesting thing is that uh, the business gives you a lot of opportunity for self rationalization. You know that you can say, well, they're gonna if I get rid of them, they're gonna go to someone else who's gonna really do them wrong. So I guess I'm better off. 
compromising myself because at least then, you know, the client will probably be better taken care of. I think a lot of your stuff helped me get through, avoid self-deception. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that I ever went there. Uh, and mm. I'm glad to hear you think I didn't go there. Um, no. I, I take a relatively tragic view of human nature yeah. um, with regard to financial planning in general, but investments in particular. And I guess I slowly came over the years, a lot of years, to think that um, that human nature is a failed investor, that, that there's so much programmed into our psyches uh, that, that without proper counsel, human nature is going to go off the rails uh, investment-wise, if not financially in general. And you just, you get to the point, I think, and, and you got to it very early, where you say, this is not a person I can help because this is not a person who chooses to be helped. And that's not my fault. Yes, he will, he will go to someone who panders to him and, and will do what he wants to do or won't argue with what he wants to do. And, and, and it will probably end badly. But I, I, have to, I have to plow my 40 acres. And plowing my 40 acres means to me uh, financially, morally, from the standpoint of the energy that I can bring to my family mm -hmm. and my, my life, um, I have to draw the line. And I think you, you, as quickly as anyone I've known, you got to that point. And I think it's why you are where you are today. Well, I, I appreciate that. I think that the element that you refer to about our families is very important because I think a lot of people feel if they're happy at work, they come home potentially more in a good mood or whatnot. But you know, the, the business is in, in has a certain embedded uh, uncertainty around it because markets do what they do mm -hmm. and 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 whatnot. But I think that that gets underestimated. How important it is that the what the energy the the dynamic with clients if it's if you're largely arguing with clients all day and you think you're going to go home and be a loving father and husband you're living in la la land. absolutely and that was something that i think you got through out of your teaching right or very early on where did um you start in your career nick i started as a retail stockbroker trainee at the late lamented ef hutton and company on the 1st of May, 1967. And where was the uh, S&P in 1967, dare I ask? I'm, I'm gonna guess it was around 100. And the Dow was probably right around 800. I wonder, I don't, I don't have any strong sense of that. I know the, uh, the sort of famous uh, 66 to 81 market, if it ended at 800, it, somewhere around there, what would have been in that range. So in the course of your lifetime uh, and career from when you started in production at uh, EF Hutton to as we sit here today in your advisor advisory to advisor mm -hmm. business, the S&P has gone from 100 to over uh, 5,000. Indeed. You um, had an idea that you used to share. I haven't heard you bring it up a lot lately, maybe because of the obsolete nature of postage stamps. Uh, in this day and age, but um, I did what you suggested. You remember that old idea of the postage stamp from yeah. your, on the back of a business card? Yeah. One of the elements of my belief that human nature is a, a failed investor is that people can't tell the difference between currency and money. Yeah. And so they endow the idea of doing things that make your currency go sideways as being safe somehow. Refusing all of the evidence of their senses 
which is that the cost of everything is going up all the time. And so I guess if I had a coherent idea early in the game, and if I did, it was one of very few, um, it, it was that long-term investments were for one reason and one reason only, and that was to defeat inflation. Mm-hmm. That it was n- not not just not for stocks to go up, but for stocks to go up and raise their dividends at a significant premium to inflation. And is another way of saying it to just protect purchasing power. And that's in my own bonehead simplistic way. That's what the stamps were about. I I went around um, with a stamp from the current year and a stamp from 30 years ago, which is about what I think the average two person retirement of this day and age is going to be about. Look, as a proxy for the cost of living, look where a stamp was 30 years ago. Look where a stamp is now. What are you doing to keep up with that much less get ahead of it? Um, And that was um, an illustration that worked really well for me. Based on an impulse to simplify. And I think that's the underlying element in the way I approached people and the way I approached the business and the way I talk to advisors now. It's, It's how simple can you make it without doing violence to the underlying concept. Yeah. Einstein said everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. And that's what I, one of the things that I've tried to do. And when I think that the postage stamp very much did that, and, and even if today, because people are a little less used to mailing a, a letter than, than they used to be, the principle's still the same. It could be a different consumer product, but the notion of investing and keep up purchasing power, you you had a way of expressing this idea with the postage stamp. In a B2B context, with from practitioner to practitioner, you had another construct that I uh, borrowed on heavily over the years. And I've always wanted to ask you this question. Uh, I had taped at the bottom of my computer monitor through the first few years I was building my business at Payne Weber, P equals one over N. Um, do you believe, I'm going to explain it in a moment, or, or let you explain it, but I wonder if you believe that that is a unique formula to our business, or is there, is there universal applications? It, tell, tell your audience what it means. So essentially, those of us who are out in, and, and uh, you know, day-to-day engaged in client acquisition, business development... Mm-hmm. That P, a qualified prospect, equaled one over N, the number of attempts, efforts, activities you did. And all you had to do was find your N, and then you didn't worry about a lost P because you knew the formula for getting a successful P, a conversion of a prospective client to a client. And so it it basically reduced, it was a tautology for one thing. By definition, it's true. (laughs) Um, But it helped people, I think, focus on that the key input was not the closing of the next P, but it was the N that would drive the P because of math. That it, that it, in the long run, the quality of your business was going to be an absolute function of the number of people you showed your work to. Right. And that worrying about how any one person responded to it or feeling personally rejected by any one person or any 10 people or any 20 people's uh, turning you aside, that the law of large numbers was going to get you wherever you wanted to go. And that was just a, um, again, a very simplistic way of trying to, to take the anxiety out of it. It seems like it's an algebraic expression of another line that you use a lot that I think is incredibly wise. Uh, The focus on inputs, not outcomes. Yeah. And that when, um, 
we are doing the inputs, we are putting the material together, the, the, we know we're, we're organizing a right strategy, solution, uh, interaction with a particular person, uh, we're delivering truth. We're delivering wisdom. Yes, that's the critical thing. And that uh, we can control that, but we cannot control the outcome. Nor um, should we try. I think that that needs to be put up at the top of Nick Murray's contributions to myself and, and probably to an awful lot of mm. people in that um, it's very hard to be discouraged once you accept that the thing you're discouraged by is totally out of your control. It's, I would argue it's impossible to be discouraged by. It's certainly irrational. And it's and intellectually, it's incoherent. Yeah. Um, and yet, I think some people need to take more responsibility for the inputs, and they need to divorce themselves from responsibility of the outcomes. In a way, P equals one over N is kind of that. To focus on the N, the P comes, go to work. Indeed. So if you sold vacuum cleaners for a living, or if you sold typewriters in the 1960s for IBM, would P equals one over N still apply? Sure. Why not? Why not? But you, you never thought of it that way. You just thought of it as an advisor profession piece of wisdom. I thought of it, again, as a boneheaded way of trying to leach the anxiety of building a business out of it. Yeah. To, uh, of staving off the, the despair that we're all uh, at risk of when we're building a business, which is, this is never going to work. I'm never going to get there. And what I said from my own bitter experience was, you're inevitably going to get there as long as you don't stop. And there was that. Do you believe still a line that I, I know I'm quoting verbatim because I remember it so distinctly, you um, used to say in the early years of the event we would do here in Manhattan in 09, 010, you have the life you want. Yes, you, do, you absolutely have the life you want. And um, if, if you claim that you don't want the life you have, what are you doing about it? We're, we're the product of our thought. We're the product of what we do all day long. And if we get to the end of the day, and if, especially if we get to the end of a lot of days, and it's not working, it, it is still what we produced. And I don't think that has anything to do with the business. I think that has to do with life. What, uh, change your mind. Change your mind. So change your mind as a uh, means to then changing your actions. Sure. And, and if anything, that will change. Ultimately, that will change the outcome. Well, I kind of cut you off from your story because I know if you entered the business May 1st, 1967, um, th some of these things you're talking about regarding behavioral modification, long-term outcomes, they could not have been the focus of Wall Street in the stock brokerage profession. Good Lord, no. This was the, this was the tail end, the dying years of GoGo. -Go. And uh, would, did that make it an enjoyable time to be in the business or a challenging time? It was a terrible time. In the sense that the guys who went ashore on D-Day who had never seen combat, that was a terrible experience. Mm. But if you survived it and you learned from it as you fought all the way across Europe in the bloodiest event in human history, the, the, the knowledge that you acquired was became priceless mm. it became it clearly became priceless i feel that way about that period by the way i don't think that i would have been taken on by ef hutton at the age of 23 if it if it were not that sort of go-go mm -hmm. youth culture <laughs> 
guys coming in who had no adult memory and, mm -hmm. and therefore huge enthusiasm for what they were selling. Um, uh, I, I bless the fact that it was those days. I'm not sure that somebody with my resume could get taken on yeah. by a major firm uh, these days. It was a dreadful time. Um, basically, you mentioned the Dow, which the Dow, I think, made an intraday high in 1966, which is the year before I came in, mm -hmm. and closed over a thousand in 1981 yeah. or two. Yeah. So, and and in between, you had the nightmare of runaway inflation. Uh, on, on a scale that we had never seen yeah. before uh, or or even since other than very briefly but it just went on and on and on um, and uh, it was it was from d-day to the run if you mm -hmm. will so did you stay at ef hutton uh all through the the that period 60s 70s in, into the 80s? I did not. I was e at E.F. Hutton for eight years, and then I went to Sandy Wiles, uh -huh. um, Shearson, yeah. Hayden Stone, which was come to, in 1975, was just coming together as what would become the second largest brokerage firm yeah. uh, in, the, in the country. And and I was there for about eight years, and then I was with Bear Stearns for the next eight. And at some point, correct me if I'm wrong, even E.F. Hutton ended up coming into the Shearson, what became Shearson Lehman world through another acquisition, but you were long gone. Long after my time. After that. Long after my time. And then you ended at Bear Stearns. So you're, you're on Wall Street, and you're in the private wealth retail side of the business through these decades. And there isn't much of a, a professionalization of financial planning at that time. Slowly but surely. Um, I was actually, speaking of things that I could never happen again, I was a founding director of the New York City chapter of what was then called the International Association of Financial Planning. Now the Financial Planning Association yeah. in 1975. Oh. And that was the, the very first beginnings of the idea that um, at, the, at the level of a normal family, the, their financial lives should be coordinated. Up until that time, it was just the banks selling against the insurance companies, selling against the stockbrokers. Um, what the, the disaster of the 70s taught me, among many other things, was that uh, there was no rationality outside of planning, that, it, that, that however you did it, however you patched it together, there had to be a coherent plan. And that was, in those days, a fairly novel idea. Was it resisted? Uh, you talk a lot about us in our profession needing to be countercultural because we're fighting against human nature, which you described as a failed investor. Uh, we we're fighting against the media, which is something we'll, we'll talk about more in a moment. Um, but was there a resistance to the idea of attaching investment management to planning? It was an idea whose time was coming. Was it resisted? Sure. Mm. Um, but it was resisted with less and less conviction. Mm. You had, uh, I remember in 1975 or 1976 at what was, I guess by that time, Shearson Lowe Broads, you had the firm helping people become CFPs. Oh, okay. Um, uh, was it still largely a stock and bond culture? Yeah, but the idea was coming. I wonder how, how much of that was um, just related to the incentives of compensation, that on one hand, 
planning and some of these more consultative ideas were out there, but the the compensation was still commission driven, therefore kind of hard to, to get, pull people out of that. Yes. Um, fees took their own time to come come in and it was hard. It was hard to do planning in a commission driven um, environment. But Again, morally, you came to the conclusion, what, what choice did you have? What year did you write Excellent Investment Advisor? 90. 1997. And then New Financial Advisor came out um, 2001. I, I finished um, drafting uh, the New Financial Advisor on September 11, 2001. Okay. I think when you read them now, you notice that your point about more consultative business. In Excellent Investment Advisor, there was a lot of talk about the uh, load funds ver no, versus no load and getting mm -hmm. paid for advice. And then by the time New Financial Advisor came out, the kind of fee-based yep. uh, approach had been a little more permeated. Um, it's funny, I don't think enough about how fortunate I was with timing because I can say, and it'd be true, that I never did a commission but I entered the business right at the time at which fee-based business yeah, you did. had become you did. a thing. And so mm -hmm. it's fascinating how much easier it was to build a business with, uh, off of advice and fees as opposed to convert a business from transactions and commissions to fees. Uh, many of my colleagues that already had an incumbent commission transactional business never were really quite, they would convert like 50% and feel like, you know, they'd done their deal. Um, where I think I had a kind of lucky timing of just building it the right way to begin with. Well, it gives you hope in the business. I think the business gets secularly better, secularly saner. Hmm. Um, I'm hugely optimistic about the business of financial planning and the business of of wealth management. Um, I, I think it, we're in a golden age and and entering a golden age of of financial planning. There's just so much more wealth among ordinary people, and the and the issues that they're facing are just so complex that, you know, when I started out, you, you would say, here's a stock we think is going up, or we think the market's going up. And what was your basis for that? But here, people are coming into the business and they're saying, all right, you have to take care of the protection piece. People's lives have to be insured. Their their income has to be insured, and when you got that, then you can start investing for retirement in all manner of of tax protected ways of approaching that. And then there's if if you do this right, there's going to be a significant estate. First of all, there's going to be a thirty year retirement. Yeah. Um, with all the multitudinous challenges of that, inflation being the primary one, yeah. I think, and 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 just more and more ordinary people with significant estates. Um, it's a th it's a thrilling time to to be in the business. I think when um, I know you get asked these questions a lot because I I see them in the newsletter, I hear them at our annual event. Um, and I also just don't believe that people are asking totally different questions to you than the types of things that I have to hear all the time. When you see end of the business in May of 1967, I'm aware of what happened at the Democratic National Convention in 1968. People right now, as we are getting ready to go through what I imagine will be a reasonably unpleasant and somewhat obnoxious election 2024, there seems to be a tendency to believe that this is the first time our country's ever seen political turmoil. The, this is, you know, okay, that's great. You've always been a long-term equity guy, but, you know, now we have political tribalism where we apparently never had that before. Or now we have excessive government debt where we never had that before. 
entering the business in, in the late 60s as you did, uh, being a history reader as I know you to be, mm -hmm. how important do you think it is that people who are going to be in the advice business know their history? Well, I think it's terribly important that they know as much history as possible, not just, and not just financial history. Mm -hmm. Although I think everybody, I'm, everybody in the profession should be a reader of financial history. It's, it's because you can't get surprised. Um, uh, the larger question of whether anybody is reading American history anymore is a is a uh, is a question for the times but i i think people go nuts around elections because people go nuts around elections quadrennially the investing public goes bananas um my experience is that that's always been the case always been the case there's just different gradations of craziness. I mean, if you said to me in 1968, um, the, the president of the United States will get heckled at the State of the Union message, mm -hmm. I would have said, no, no, a lot of bad stuff is likely to happen, but that, no, mm. we wouldn't we wouldn't descend yeah. to that kind of bear baiting. Um, so if you, if you want me to say, if someone wants me to say things are worse now than they ever were, I, there, there's some merit to that argument and then it's, and it's very limited merit. Yeah. What, what I ask anybody about is, how do you work this into your investment policy? How do you work this into your, um, your financial plan? Yeah. If you know anything about long-term investing, you know you got to be in equities. If you know anything about equities, you know that the key to them is long-term compounding. Yeah. As the late lamented Charles Munger said, the, the first thing about compounding is never to interrupt it yeah. unnecessarily. Um, so yeah, you're going to get out of the market and then and wait for the election, and then you're going to get back in the market. I, I just it's just it's a way of people letting out their anxieties about the election because they feel unable to control anything else about it. Um, well, I'll get out of the market, you know, yeah. the, the, this, this kind of thing. The other concept that I think, uh, by the time I may have heard this expression from you, I had done a lot more study in behavioral finance, but the concept of regret being, being this uh, emotion that was so counterproductive to investor success, where I'm used to thinking of the, dis, the, the painful decision or the or the expensive decision being the choice to exit a good investment plan. But you talked about how then subsequent to the decision to exit comes the regret, which makes the reentry all the more difficult, rinse and repeat, this negative feedback loop that regret creates. And the only way to avoid it being not to make the first mistake to begin with. Really? Uh, it's, it's a brilliant concept. Well, it's my experience. It, uh, again, uh, what I actually say is that the most powerful emotion in investing, yeah. because it is so long lived, yeah. is long term regret, is, is the regret of making the big mistake, whether it was uh, out of terror or out of euphoria, yeah. making the big mistake. Um, and, and what that does to the psyche of some, I'm, I mean, you have had clients, I have had clients who never recovered from it. Huh? That's right. Um, uh, but how do you, how do you convince somebody 
that he's going to regret something for the rest of his life. My experience is you don't. You, you just, it, it goes, it comes back to this issue of people trusting your advice and people allowing themselves to be helped yeah. and not second guessing the advice and saying, yes, yes, I, I realize you're reminding me that this is what I signed up for. That I that I was going to go through this cycle of terror and euphoria, and that I had to try to to tune it out because I couldn't make a rational I couldn't make rational investment policy out of it. And to me, this is again because our what we're ultimately fighting is human nature. This never goes away, and it, it doesn't get worse, and it doesn't get better. It just gets human. Um, Is it fair to say that the human nature doesn't get worse, but I think it's that we have the application of this worse in this sense, the media. That in 1967, human nature is the same as it is in 2024. Um, I was born in 1974, and you went through that horrific bear market. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then, of course, we talk about long, reasonably flattish type period in American equities and the stagflation of the 70s. Um, I only attach it to this reason, not for partisan reasons, but for just historical timing. The Reagan years in the 80s, the Clinton years in the 90s, um, they, there was just a really powerful bull market that mm -hmm. happened in the American economy. Um, but there also was then this creation of what was formerly uh, FNN, the Financial News Network, CNN bought, acquired, spun off, and then CNBC was formed. I think when I first began reading you, the kind of exclusive hub of what many would deem financial pornography, a term I did steal from you, was CNBC. The internet changed a lot of that. Now, social media. Well, social media. Uh, combined with internet, combined yeah. with uh, streaming and, and yeah. multiple cable opportunities, not just one. Um, but I, I don't think any of it's new. It's still the same human nature that plays into uh, euphoria or fear. Yes. But, but there's opportunities for that to go uh, hyperbolic. Well, I don't know. Are there more opportunities for that to go hyperbolic than there ever were before? I I I, I don't I don't. You, think you so. had the newsletter industry in the in the seventies, right? Was that a people writing the the fear and gloom newsletters about the apocalypse and gold bugs and all this type I'm, of stuff? I'm more conscious of stock tip newsletters in the nineteen mm. sixties and seventies. I. Mm. So, but, but it's the other side of the same coin, playing into euphoria, the, the gold bugs playing into fear. But I guess my point is people have quick access now. If they, if they want to uh, get panicked, their emotion's already there, human nature's already there. Sure. But there's an opportunity to pour a little more kerosene on the fire with, with the internet. Well, I think there's two things. I, I think that the, the, the screaming... The, the the noise of the people are surrounded by today financially is exponentially higher than it was. When I came in the business, you saw uh, the stock tables and the times in the morning, mm -hmm. and then the post ran fragments of of closing prices in the afternoon. And that if you didn't call your broker, you wouldn't know. Yeah, nobody said. In the media, what what had happened in in, in Wall Street today? Um, so if, if I look at that and I look at the the cacophony, the screaming of streaming and and social media, which is so destructive and all of the noise, I say yes, the level of noise is exponentially higher than it than it used to be. Does that cause people? And the other thing, of course, is that they can push a button. They don't have to call anybody, and they can push a button for no commission. Yeah. And is is the, the, does that make human nature 
significantly more of a danger to itself than it than it always was. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I guess. I, I still, I, I go back and forth because I still believe uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. Absolutely nothing. And yet there just are, are ways in which these things may manifest itself. But I mean, if, if it wasn't this, it could be something different. The point I think is that you make over and over is that human nature is the failed investor. And that most of what we deal with in the advisory profession is some form of a distinctly human malfunction, whether mm -hmm. it be yeah. euphoria or or panic. And I, and it's interesting that we're so used to thinking about this in the context of fear and panic. Certainly some of the seminal moments in my career, you think about the last 25 years, we had 9-11, uh, which coincided with the dot-com implosion and a very mild national recession. And we also then, uh, seven years later, had the mother of them all with the global financial crisis. Yep. And then now, more recently, the COVID moment so these are rather significant events, but when you think about the course of human history, the only thing that would be unique is if there wasn't any event at all, just some drawdown, to use an equity term, but recessionary event, newsworthy event, that's the norm, not the exception. But humans um, in euphoric moments, this seems to me to be an underrated risk for advisors, that it when all of a sudden the person's so worried about the next apocalypse then flips on you as to so worried I'm going to miss the next 60,000 move in Bitcoin or whatever the hell it is. Again, it's, it's, it's just human nature. I came into business in 1967 and I was dealing with clients as, as any of us would be dealing with clients at any time in our careers largely between age 50 and age 70. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Longer now, but, and I sat there and I said, if I'm talking to a 50 year old in 1967, he was born in 1917. Am I doing the math right? Or is it 1907? Oh, seven. Right. Even worse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is somebody who lived through the stock market crash and the depression and the complete liquidation of the American economy. And you, you would think had learned to be terrified of the stock market, completely terrified of the stock market, that you would never get over that. Um, and here they were speculating on Ling Temco Vought. I mean, on, on these, uh, uh, what did they call them then? I've lost the word. Conglomerates and, and new issues and uh, anything with uh, computer leasing in it. People going nuts at the top of a market. It's just human. They were, afraid, just, they were afraid of missing out just like they're afraid of missing out of the next big thing now. I guess. And I, I've made that point that... Um, I don't know that we had even kind of slept off the hangover at dot com before people started flipping condos and doing all yeah. the well, but that was they had taken it all of those speculative instincts and applied them to real estate, yeah. which and couldn't possibly go down. So so fear doesn't ever become a new permanent paradigm. We just vacillate be, or oscillate between fear and panic or fear and euphoria. I think it's between fear and another kind of fear. I think all negative emotions, That's maybe this is yeah. trying to dig too deep into yeah. it, but I think all ne negative emotions are offshoots of fear. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 at the bottom, it's fear of having your entire net worth destroyed. Yeah. And at the top, it's fear of watching people you know are 10 times dumber than you yeah. coining money and 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 yelling in your face about it yeah uh, which is what always happened um, the the aforementioned uh, Charlie Munger that you brought up has a, a line about at the end of the day uh, envy is a more powerful force than greed 
uh, that was certainly true through the housing bubble. People could not tolerate seeing their neighbor who, as you say, either was or they perceived to be dumber than them, yeah. making that easy money. Um, the other side of this coin this is a good way for us to start to wrap things up because this is a definite Nick Murray philosophy that I adopted many years ago. That all of this negative emotion comes from fear, but the positive comes from love. Yeah, very much so. Love of family, love of relationships, love of uh, transcendent country, truth. Love, love of country, um, love of capitalism, yeah. love of all the enlightenment values. I, I, I think, why do I, why do I own a, a life insurance policy that I pay tens of thousands of dollars a year on and have for 30 years? Why do we do that rather than buying a boat? I mean, it just, it, it, maybe that's a, an extreme example, but all good long-term financial decisions purely come from love. I'm convinced of it. Mm. Um, and that's the only antidote to fear. That, that is the antidote to fear. But I think that bringing this back to the advisory profession, that, that, that reality is true for all people. It's universal. Mm -hmm. The antidote to fear is love. Um, in the advisory profession, I think that those of us who really take the profession seriously are calling within it. Um, they have to appreciate that what they're doing has to be driven by love in a very specific sense that um, you love a value system, you love a, a way of life, a, you know, the American ideal, though, and certainly people's own um, religious and ethical uh, uh, belief system. But I think that when I read Nick Murray 25 years ago, 23 years ago, don't take toxic clients, don't take people who don't follow your advice. I had to learn to love the clients that did follow my advice huh. because I was subsidizing, um, the, my good clients were subsidizing my bad clients. Yes. And that, and that wasn't loving. Mm -mm. And then I had to love my wife and children enough to Really not come sense. home. Not come home at night, having been d drained from toxic clients, or, or or taking out all the pain that was dealt to you during the day yeah. on on them, which, which sometimes was... wasn't from clients. Sometimes this comes back to the input outcome. Um, you know, there were a few weeks there in September of two thousand eight. You may recall, I didn't know Morgan Stanley was going to be in business. Mm -hmm. There were a few months there. We didn't know the national economy, the global credit. There's these moments, you know, 9-11, COVID. That COVID few weeks was a, was a bizarre period of time. Um, but I couldn't come home and, and take out the frustrations of uncertainty in this profession I chose on my family. But the reason mm -hmm. had to be because of love. Yeah. So you taught that to me. Well, thank you. Um... It's a lesson I suspect we all learn the hard way. I certainly did. Mm. Like every important lesson I ever learned, I'm sorry to say. Wow. Had to learn it the hard way. There's, <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of good that accrues to longevity. Well, I, I uh, appreciate the fact that in your longevity, it's funny how much you talk about retirement is I think we both use it as a financial term sure. uh, as opposed to a, a life description. Um, as best I can tell in, in your quote unquote retirement, uh, I didn't meet you until your career of retirement began and you were doing all this great work that's had this impact yeah. on me. But I think that um, the longevity you describe and the, and the lessons learned, uh, they become very valuable. And then the ability to, to mentor and teach others, including, I, I got to think there's an awful lot of people that have been influenced and helped by you that have never even expressed it to you the, the way that I might have done so here today. I mean, there's, there, there's this ability, our society seems to be anti-mentorship right now. Uh, there's this idea that it's a wonderful thing to get to the beach when you're 50 years old. Um, I turn 50 next month. I keep saying this as I'm touring my book related to uh, 
uh, defensive work. I need more 75 year olds counseling me. I need less 25 year olds counseling Absolutely. me. Absolutely. And that's the reason. Absolutely. Nick, thanks for taking the time to. Well, thank you. I, I'm glad to have been a part of your success. I'm very glad. It means a lot to me to have you and uh, even more, of course, for everything I've said over the last 25 years. I appreciate all of you listening to us as we've conversed about some of these various topics, all of which are obviously near and dear to uh, Nick and myself in our own careers and professions and lives. But um, hopefully you found some nuggets and takeaways relevant to you. We uh, appreciate your participation in our effort here at National Review's Capital Record, and I intend to continue in my ongoing endeavor to defend a free and virtuous society. Thanks for listening to Capital Record.